second most disadvantaged region in the EEC. It is characterized by intense poverty, the worst unemployment rates in Europe, and poor housing stock. Almost a quarter of its population live below the official poverty line, and there are high levels of perinatal and infant deaths. It is also characterized by high levels of violence. The region's capital city, Belfast, and particularly Catholic West Belfast, is even more seriously disadvantaged. In Ballymurphy, a Republican stronghold situated on the edge of West Belfast under Divis Mountain, the picture is even more startlingly bleak. It has the added trauma of a community which has witnessed a disturbingly high level of violence over the past 20 years a violence which has left scarcely a single family untouched by its presence. Up to the present time, 127 people have died as a direct result of the troubles in the greater Ballymurphy area. It was here, in the midst of the Ballymurphy community, that St. Thomas's Intermediate was located. Built in 1957 for Catholic boys of secondary school age, who were considered educational failures, St. Thomas has quickly developed a strong relationship with the local community. During its infancy, it was variously used as a community center, and even mass was once celebrated in its assembly hall on Sundays. The eruption of the Troubles in 1969 not only adversely affected the community at large, but it also meant that neither the school nor its pupils were immune from the traumatizing effects of the ensuing violence. This is the last time all of you will be doing summer tests here. Not only the boys we leave, but the first years. It's a culmination of your Years work. I want you to do your best at that. I'll be around later on today to give you your final timetable. In October 1988, the school was closed due to a reorganization of schools in the Catholic controlled sector. The local community, who were not consulted, felt aggrieved. There was a major problem there because the, in order to qualify for a house, you had to have a large family. And the, the smallest family in the area would have been nine children, eight or nine children. And you could have got them as big as 15. Indeed, it wasn't unknown. There was a family there, 22 children. In the initial situation of Bally Murphy was a very difficult one. Uh, even back in the 50s, it, it was an area of high unemployment. And in many ways, uh, people had found, found it hard to make ends meet, found it hard to bring up the quite large families that many of the, the parents had. And um, it had been built, as it were, out almost on the edge. It sounds strange to talk about that now, but it was on the edge of Belfast then. Next up was the mountains. We had no buses, we had no schools, we had no churches, we had nothing. In 1954, there was an old man and his wife came around three times a week and their son with a donkey and cart and the vegetables. As there was no shops then in the estate or anywhere around about, we were forced to go down to the Falls Road to do our shopping. And at that stage, many a time I've laughed about it since, uh, I wasn't aware that you could buy a stone of coal until I actually saw somebody bringing it up the, the, the White Rock Road in a pram. Bally Murphy housing estate was completed in the 1950s. Statutory efforts to develop it as an integrated estate populated by both Protestants and Catholics 
were thwarted by the urgent need for houses with the sudden closure of temporary wartime hutments nearby. The estate rapidly became stigmatized, and by 1960, Bally Murphy's reputation for bad rent payers was well established. But this represented only one aspect of a wider picture, revealing statutory neglect, chronic overcrowding, with no provision for the youth of the estate, and a growing unemployed population. Added to this already burdened community was the fact that substantial sums of money were being taken from the estate to pay for new church and school buildings. And then there's the, the problem of unemployment, which is a major difficulty. Now, that, that has got much worse now. At a time in 1969, this school, in fact, done a survey in Thomas' school, done the first survey, and they discovered that the uh, level of unemployment in the area was 47% of the his household when the national average was 5%. And that has steadily gone up. It hasn't improved at all. One of the things that was often said about Bally Murphy and it's said about other areas was a very high level of unemployment and a lot of poverty. One of the things that was said was that there was a very high incidence of sickness and even uh, at times mental uh, incapacity. Now, that was true. Uh, and it was made worse by the fact that it was a very highly artificial population because a lot of the people came to Bally Murphy who were rehoused from other areas and sometimes quite against their will. Uh, the city council had a, a policy of putting into one area people who were what they called unsatisfactory tenants. Religion and education have always been intertwined in Northern Ireland and the secularisation of the education system which occurred in Britain scarcely had an impact on the life of Irish schools, even to this day. Schools are still strictly segregated, with state schools seen as serving Protestant interests and Catholic-maintained schools as catering for Catholic children. One common feature of both systems, however, is that they are often divided along gender lines, with separate schools for boys and girls, especially at secondary level. In the maintained sector, the Catholic schools receive grants for both capital and running costs from the state. Yet the Catholic Church, through its clergy, still retains undisputed control over its schools. Government efforts to standardize the education system and to bring it into broadly similar lines to Britain have only been partially successful. It was the 1947 Education Act which shaped Northern Irish schools into what they are today. It was largely modelled on Butler's 1944 Education Act, which established the secondary modern schooling system as it is known in England today. The way it worked was that children started school at six and they went through to 14. And when the intermediate schools opened, they transferred to the intermediate schools at 11 and continued in them to 14 and then eventually to 15 and now 16. There was also an idea that the 11 plus had done a very effective job and had creamed off all of the uh, pupils who were likely to benefit from an academic education and therefore there was virtually no expectation that people going into the intermediate schools would in fact uh, take academic courses, but that they would take courses which were generally regarded as being more practical and perhaps less advanced. Let's see you reflect everything that you know onto the sheet. Would you please start now? I finish it off as quickly as you can. There was a high level of ability, at least as far as a significant section of the uh, school population was concerned in the intermediate schools and that they could be brought on as it were in the much the same manner as they would have been brought on in grammar schools. The consequences of educational streaming of pupils at 11 years of age and its negative effect on their future achievement patterns have been well documented in recent years. St. Thomas's was one of the exceptions however. 
There, the teaching staff refused to accept such externally imposed low expectations of its pupils. In spite of official distancing and at times displeasure, the teachers took the initiative themselves and made efforts to make the school more directly amenable to its pupils' needs and abilities. The school teachers, uh, the um educationalists who belong to the uh, Falls area, shall we say, people like Michael McLaverty, who was a headmaster of St. Thomas's, and uh, John McKeown, and all the teachers who are committed, they had a, a community commitment to the good of the kids in the area. And, and realistically speaking, a GCE a certificate, a general certificate in education, was somehow a passport to a certain kind of uh, more whitey collar Polish Jews gain a job. And so uh, while they maintained the school, the intermediate school, and they worked in the intermediate school and they were in the system, they, they actually used the school to slightly subvert the system. Michael McCloverty, who's one of the, I think one of the best writers that we ever produced. And he was um, the kind of person who admitted quite freely that, that he could have sold a vast number of books if he had played to the popular market, but he never did. He just simply wrote good literature. And a very curious thing was that you could go to a university in the United States and find a Michael McLaverty corner dedicated to Michael McLaverty, who taught in St. Thomas's School. But I, I chiefly remember McLaverty for his uh, for a personal uh, relationship with him as First of all, he was he was sort of a foster father to me in, in one way because I was I was uh, I had done a degree in English at Queen's University, and I was really I suppose envisaged myself as going on to teach in a grammar school to teach sixth form English, and he had a special interest in me because I was a, a writer or I wasn't a, I was beginning to write, and I had a I had a, a hope in that direction, and he used to say to me like, "Well, now, Mr. Heaney," he said, "Did you ever notice when you looked at a when you looked at a picture of a rugby team in the newspaper, wouldn't you have known by their faces the boys that had studied poetry? You know? I said, of course, Mr. McLaurin, of course I would do. During the school's 30-year history, there were only three headmasters. The longest serving was Dr. Brendan Carville, who took charge during the school's final 14 years. Michael McLaverty was the first head teacher, and he was replaced by one of the school's most memorable characters, Sean McKeown, more commonly known to the pupils as Sammy. I always think of the headmaster as Mr. McKeown rather than Sammy. Here was um, w w what I came to look on as a fighting headmaster in the sense that he was prepared to fight for everything. It was quite a difficult thing uh, because there was a kind of polite refusal which was in fashion at that time. Uh, both in church circles and in education circles generally. And it was very, very difficult to get what you want, wanted, but uh, it was clear that during all those years that, that I was sitting on the, on the school committee, that he was prepared to fight for everything he could lay his hands on. Uh, for example, they, they didn't have a playing field for many, many years. And we all, all assumed that the reason why they didn't was that we had a very bad government which was discriminating against the people. First of all, because they, they, they were in a Catholic area, and secondly, because they were in a, in a poor area. Uh, and most of the resources were going into the grammar schools anyway. Um, so it was a very highly class-orientated thing. But then we found to our amazement in the beginning of the 70s that the hold-up on the playing field was not a government affair at all. It was, in fact, a hold up on the part of the church, who were unwilling to spend the amount of money which they would have had to spend, something like maybe 15%, uh, in order to produce the playing field. In spite of the neglect and the lack of interest from both the state and the church in relation to the school, there was a vibrancy and determination within it to do the best possible by its pupils teachers initiated many extracurricular activities outside of school hours of a sporting and cultural nature. The school was also justly proud of its academic successes too, evidenced by the number of its pupils who availed of third-level education 
at university and teacher training colleges. Given that St. Thomas's was a Catholic maintained school, receiving a smaller share of state funded educational resources, which went primarily into the more prestigious grammar schools, its achievements were notable. When lack of interest and lack of will by the Catholic clerical administrators, who controlled the purse strings of the maintained sector was added, its achievements became remarkable. From time to time you came across this uh, amazing talent. Somebody would show you some drawing or cartoon or something like that. But in a sense it all came to nothing. Because in a sense, people didn't take a school seriously enough. And uh, whereas the most banal things coming through a grammar school would be hailed as great achievements, some flashes of genius in another kind of school would be totally disregarded. And I think there was the tragedy of the whole situation. Sport assumed an important part in the life of the school, and the energy and enthusiasm with which it was embraced by many pupils and teachers alike was not confined simply to the sports department. We had nine children, four of them boys. All four went to St. Thomas's. Our sons were very much uh, GAA and hurly minded, and the school St. Thomas's encouraged that quite a lot. At that stage, there was no football pitch or anything, so they had to depend on different clubs for the pitch for, to practice and travel far and wide to do so. Sport became a way of decreasing the social isolation of the school outside of its own community, a way of looking beyond its immediate concerns and engaging competitively with others from differing religious and cultural traditions. The collective and individual successes of its pupils were a source of pride. In the 1970s, the school produced three professional football players, the best known of which is the ex-Northern Ireland international, Jerry Armstrong. St. Thomas's school um, was a very sport-minded school. You know, not just uh, Gaelic football and hurling and soccer, but in basketball as well. I always remember we had a very good basketball side. And um, we used to do gymnastic displays. And there was, there was quite a lot. There was quite a lot of enjoyment. I, I used to enjoy my school days. A lot of my football I played in the early days were on the streets. You know, we didn't have uh, we didn't have any football pitches we could play on, so we played we played in the streets. We used lampposts as goals. So in those days, I was not looking for a career in professional football. Um, I was looking towards my academic, uh, my education, and uh, I was studying to do O levels and A levels. I wanted to become an architect, and I had great plans to become an architect. But things all changed. Jerry Armstrong, what a worker he is. Striding away there with Hamilton to his right. Norman Whiteside up on the far side of the area. Still Billy Hamilton, he's got past Tendilio. And Arkanari, Armstrong! Northern Ireland have scored through Jerry Armstrong. And it's the 100th goal of this World Cup tournament. And it could be a priceless one for Northern Ireland. Watch Arkanada. And Armstrong drives it through him, through the defender's legs. And Northern Ireland have taken the lead. The school soccer team was run by the geography teacher, Mr Purvis. I don't think he fancied me as a player, you know, for the soccer side. He looked upon me basically just as a Gaelic footballer. Um, but then due to uh, difficulties that happened during those times, there was three or four of the soccer team, the senior soccer team, who were either interned or in prison or whatever it was. And uh, he, he didn't have a team. He didn't have a team. And he started calling up players from uh, the Gaelic side. And uh, I was one of the players who came into the side. And uh, within three or four months, I was playing regularly in the side and uh, went on to captain the team to the school's cup final. In 1998, was only one aspect of the troubles to affect the Bally Murphy community and St. Thomas's school. In 1969, when Catholic houses were burnt out by loyalists and scores of families were forced to flee their homes as a result of sectarian intimidation, St. Thomas's school was used as a refugee centre, providing accommodation for both the families and whatever belongings they had managed to salvage. 
a crowd of women in Ballymurphy organised uh, St Thomas' School to be set up as a refugee camp and did the best we could in regards to cooking and cleaning and transport to get them to St Thomas's. And uh, they had their furniture here, there and everywhere. Any of them who weren't completely burned out. It was sad, it was a very, very sad occasion. While the school was operating as a refugee centre, one of its ex-pupils, Gerard Macaulay, was killed in a sectarian murder in the Lower Falls. He was 15 years of age and had just finished his schooling. But in 1966, even three years before this, the first person to be killed was another ex-pupil of the school. 18-year-old Peter Ward was murdered in a bar called the Malvern Arms in the Lower Shankill area in the early hours of June 26th. A prominent member of the UVF, Gusty Spence, was subsequently jailed for life for this murder. As the troubles continued, Northern Ireland obtained increasingly prominent coverage by the world media, and St. Thomas's was to achieve an unenviable notoriety after the arrest and detention of several of its teenage pupils under the widely criticized Special Powers Act. In the House of Commons, the government's defense spokesperson, Geoffrey Johnson, was asked how many youths under the age of 15 had been arrested under the Special Powers Act in December 1971. He replied that 29 youths under the age of 15 had been arrested. Of these, 18 were 14 years old. Six were 13 years old, two were 12, two were 11, and one was only 10 years of age. Most of the times there was heavy military presence in the area and was very worrying then for mothers and their boys going to St. Thomas's at the, as there had been several arrests. And on different occasions, mothers had to escort their boys to the school and go and collect them because that seemed to be the time when the military did patrol the area. Particularly at lunch times, the military they always appeared outside the school and they would stop young fellows going out. And uh, it was a regular feature of, of the activity here that the principal school teacher and, and the other teachers had to go out and, and rescue young people from the clutches of the military. We are not objecting to these children being arrested. We're objecting to the manner in which they're being arrested. These children were taken from their beds in the dark hours of the morning. They were separated from their parents and without their parents' consent, were taken to a place which nobody knew about. Even their parents, after exhaustive inquiries, didn't know where they were. We made exhaustive inquiries and didn't know where they were. The army and the police both refused to let us know where these boys were. We now know, we now know that they were interrogated under conditions that we're all too familiar with. And of course, naturally enough, the headmaster was the person who was um, most uh, called upon to do something about it. There was very little he can, could do, but he was absolutely fearless in, in doing what little there was. We had a mass meeting of teachers yesterday. Over 500 teachers came together yesterday and, and they decided that in future, that if any of the children were arrested on the Special Powers Act and detained, that a deputation would go in to, to the particular barracks or, or military barracks, wherever the children were detained, and they'd pick at that place until the children, child would be released. Isn't this uh, a rather... Yes. Isn't it a rather extreme action for teachers to undertake? It's not extreme because this business is very serious. We're trying to inculcate respect for law and order in these children. These children have now seen how the office of law and order work. How are we going to teach them any respect for law, law and order when these, they see it carried out in such a way at such close quarters? As far as the outside world was concerned, at that time, um, the government, the British government, expected that schools teachers, headmasters, welfare officers, clergy and all the rest would be on their side. And they, they, they seemed not to be able to cope with the possibility that perhaps clergy from time to time would oppose them, as some of them did. Um, and they certainly couldn't cope with the idea that, that schools would do anything other than try to quieten people. During the five-day period between August the 9th and August the 13th, 1971, 22 people died in Northern Ireland in the initial aftermath of the introduction of internment. Of those 22, 11 civilians died in Ballymurphy alone, 
shot by the British Army, and countless more were injured. Homes were subjected to a constant series of raids during which property and personal belongings were systematically destroyed. Daily confrontations between soldiers and an angry community which felt itself under siege raged both day and night. Such a setting provided an opportunity for anti-social elements to attack both the school and the community itself. Ballymurphy was a great community, but it was never free of anti-social behaviour. Indeed, the school itself suffered continuously from break-ins at one point. Indeed, it got so bad that they went to the extent of getting two Alsatian dogs to patrol the school at night. The funny thing was that after a fortnight, they too were stolen. The resilience of the local community was severely tested. Yet in the midst of all this turmoil, the people's strength and even humour shone through. There was a tremendous need to raise the morale of people. And uh, one of the things that people used to do was hold festivals. And there would be a Spring Hill Festival or a Bobby Murphy Festival or whatever. And on one of these festivals, uh, we were all thinking, what on earth could we do? And we were all thinking of the usual things that you can do. And then all of a sudden, the idea came up, why not have a show in which there'll be nobody performing except priests? <laughs> we thought that was absolutely crazy. And because it was crazy, we said, this is a good idea. So uh, we then thought, well, OK, well, who, who have we? Um, priests are a pretty staid lot. And we searched around, and we found the most amazing thing. We found that there were priests, um, musicians, and singers, and fiddlers, and uh, not dancers, I don't think. And we sort of gathered them together and we, we called it, of course, needless to say, we called it the Holy Show. And it was great fun because uh, we, in later times, we, we actually did the very liberal thing of allowing nuns to take part. And uh, we then even allowed Protestant ministers to take part. It was really, you know, well, this was really the, the days of opening up. A number of people were interested in social change. One of the priests, Father Hugh Mullen, was partnering me in making plans to come further into the area in Valley Murphy, to create new ways of buying and selling things, to create cooperatives and so forth. He was very keen on that and he had some very good contacts outside the parish uh, and I think that we, together we, we might have done well, I don't know, we might have been more successful than, than I was, uh, but he was shot dead and that was the end of that. It was here at this field, at, at the rear of Springfield Park, that Father Mullen was shot. He'd been in his home about 150 yards away when word reached him that a man had been shot and wounded in the field. Father Mullen immediately left his house and rushed to the scene, braving a hail of crossfire as he did so. Waving a white handkerchief, he approached the wounded man. But as he did so, he was hit by a burst of automatic fire. He fell and began to crawl away, but was hit again. The first aid men who'd seen the incident rushed forward to help him, but the gunfire continued. And an 18-year-old youth, Francis Reed, who'd also rushed to the scene, was shot through the head. What happened whenever the Red Cross finally did get to him? Well, they were fired on the Red Cross. They fired on the Red Cross. It's, they kept firing. The army says, lay still. They put out in the lead hitter, lay still or you'll be shot. Father Mullen, a chaplain at St. Thomas's School, was killed on internment morning in 1971 whilst administering the last rites to a seriously injured man close to the estate. Less than a year later, the school's new chaplain, Father Fitzpatrick, was killed on the 10th of July, 1972, in the midst of a four-hour gun battle during the breakdown of ceasefire negotiations between the IRA and the British Army. When the gun battle had ceased, five other civilians lay dead and 10 were wounded. One of the dead civilians was a 13-year-old schoolgirl and two were youths of 17 years of age. The young 13 and 14-year-olds, we had nowhere to gather during the long summer holidays except the streets. In 1972, there was one particular summer that stands out in mind one terrible day when at least six people were shot dead. It was a very sudden occurrence. We all ran for cover. We didn't know what was happening. 
We remember that Father Fitzpatrick and the sisters of Mother Teresa ran to help the dead and wounded. Father Fitzpatrick ran past me, waving his handkerchief to try and get to someone to give them the last rites. It was the last thing he did. And I remember vividly that I was very frightened, trying to make my way home, trying to get to my parents. But the priest was lying bleeding. And along with two of the sisters of Mother Teresa, we carried his body into one of the local houses. I couldn't get home that evening. It was impossible. I was in a great state of shock, being so young. I'd never seen anything like this before. And indeed, it was the next morning when I got home, and my mother had to wipe the blood of Father Fitzpatrick from my body. Naturally, that was a very disturbing summer. And indeed, we were glad to get back to school. It had a great psychological effect on many of the local lads. It was hard to settle. It was hard to study after such a traumatic experience. And indeed, many of us wouldn't even dream of sitting in those rooms because the windows were facing the timber yard where the shooting had come from. In 1969, the school acquired a youth hostel in the Knockbarra Valley, in the picturesque Mourn Mountains. Initially, the hostel was used as a sanctuary for pupils, enabling them to escape briefly from their beleaguered community for a few days. A local community committee, comprised of parents and teachers, was established to coordinate the fundraising drive, and through its own efforts raised money as well as obtaining government grant and trust funding. The community was once again harnessing the energies and skills it had acquired by coping with a state of emergency that beset it in the early 70s. Skills which centered around its capacity to organize and care for its own people. This time they were directed at providing a positive recreational experience for its own children. Knockbarra actually was uh, a wonderful place. It was a great chance of getting away for it all for a week and uh, all the pupils and I suppose the teachers as well look forward to the opportunity. I did a bit of cooking and, you know, and, and really enjoyed myself. It's a very relaxing place. This is the story of our trip to Knockbarra, where we spent three very enjoyable days. We have been preparing for a month for this trip. We set off in the minibus out through the gates and headed down the White Track Road. Soon we were on the M1 motorway and headed Bobby away Belfast from... Belfast was soon left behind us Belfast. as we sped into the country and the green fields. The towns we passed through on our journeys were Ballin the Hinch, and in a short Lock, time had booked our beds. Board. The beds were all bunk beds, one up, one down. After we washed our hands and took our places at the table, said grace before meals and dinner was served. And what a dinner that was. Eight, you were and ready for another day. After breakfast, we set off in the minibus for the St. Valley Reservoir. To get there, we passed through Kilkeel and on and Kilkeel Harbour. In the harbour of Kilkeel, we saw the trawlers. Two of the trawlers were up out of the water and the hull of one of them We left to go cleaned. for a walk in Ross Traver Forest. Our destination was the Big Stone. We set off walking through a narrow road through the forest. At last, after climbing for about 10 minutes, we emerged from the trees, and there in front of us was the big stone. It was as big as two sarsons put together, and what a sight we saw from there. We were way up in the mountains above the forest, and when we looked down, we could see the sun shining on the water of Carling Fort Lock. At the urge said people wanted to get away from Ballymurphy because of the stigma and so on. We now have a stable community there. People are wanting back into it. At the urge said there wasn't one community organisation. Now you're around with something like 56 
community organisations in the area, sharing the needs of the community. All my family have grown up now, left home. I had one grandson who went to St Thomas's up until it closed, and he was very sad. As a matter of fact, he was heartbroken, having to leave St Thomas's. We're proud of Ballinger. In the early days, we had every opportunity to leave it. But why should we leave it? To me, it still reminds me of parts of old Belfast. It was a school that uh, belonged where it was. And I think over the years, what happened was that it it became it became a focus. Uh, it, it, probably the the uh, the people in the area got when the trouble started, when one kind of pressure on top of another, their, their own sense of deprivation, their own sense of being up against it, and being up against several uh, others. I mean, there was the otherness of early on. I suppose just the whole uh, system. Uh, this kind of bourgeois system, Protestant or Catholic. Then there's the otherness of, of the Catholic ghetto against the rest of the, uh, the Belfast situation. Then there was, uh, I suppose, when the trouble started, there was the, the army around and uh, a sense of having to stick up for themselves. I remember one time when I was talking to a university audience, and it was terrible. There was apathy, there was complete incomprehension, there was boredom and everything else. And at last I said, look, I'll tell you my summing up of this meeting. I'm going to leave this university and I'm going to go to Bally Murphy, and I'm going to have a stimulating conversation there. I know I will because I have one every day with people who are intellect intellectually satisfying and who know what they're about and have an immense amount of knowledge and initiative. And I went back and I had that conversation. But I don't think they understood what I meant. What you were actually getting in, in, in Bally Murphy was a, a, the emergence of a community which not only had resisted a lot of oppression and a lot of attack, but had learned to cope with life, had learned to deal with church. Uh, in fact, had learned to do things that I never saw anywhere else. I have never in my life seen such, seen such inventiveness, uh, such power of resistance, and such immense ability to create the techniques of living in the most appalling conditions. And I think that that's the most important thing that brings people here. And hundreds and hundreds of people come to Ballymurphy every year just to see how people manage to do it.